something that's been on my mind for the last two years off and on is this matter of as Christians, as believers in Christ, we need to live wisely before the unsaved people around us, before our unsaved family, our unsaved neighbours, our unsaved community or workmates or school friends. We need, as Christians, to live wise in the realisation that the unsaved people watch us. I've had this drawn to my attention repeatedly recently over the various activities going on in politically in New Zealand. And, and one of the things I've observed is that often with very passionate emotions, Christians do things without stopping and giving consideration to how the non-Christians are going to interpret the Christians' uh, behaviour and then hold God responsible for the Christians' bad behaviour. Paul speaks to this in Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 to 6. And the two verses are short, and they're following instructions that Paul gives to the Colossians on prayer. And Paul follows on by saying this, Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of your time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. As I look back over my life, I realise there have been, unfortunately and sadly, many times where I've suffered from foot and mouth disease, where I've engaged my tongue before I've engaged my brain. And that is very sad. And I've had to repent of that on a number of occasions. And Paul here is simply in these two short verses trying to captivate our Christian attention to the necessity to realize that nothing in our Christian life goes unnoticed by the outside non-Christian world. And we are to deliberately live our lives in a way that expresses Christian or biblical wisdom that will rightly impact the non-Christians that watch us. Now, he, he made a, an uncommon little comment at the end of verse 5. He said they're making the best use of the time. You'll notice there he did not say making the best use of specific occasions or specific uh, discussions, but make the best use of the time. Those allocated periods of time in life, they might be one hour times, they might be one week times or one month, or those allocated periods of time, or sections of life. For example, it might be a a vacation you go on that's a two-week vacation and you have a period of time. He said, make the most of those times so that as non-Christians engage with you, you are using that time wisely for God. And you think, well, how do I do that? I'm not a preacher. I'm not an evangelist. I don't have any spectacular public gifts or that would be noticeable, that would draw attention to the world, you don't need it. Look at verse 6. Colossians 4 verse 6. Let your speech, I think we all do that, we all speak. Let your speech be gracious. Wow. Yeah. At this, when you're a Bible teacher, you read those verses and you do a message like this and you start to think all the times I've spoken in an ungracious manner. What's that look like? He says, speech that's seasoned with salt. There was, when you put salt in food, it tends to bring out the flavour more, but it also tends to mellow out, and it brings some of the high, peaky taste down, and it uplifts some of the mellow flavours. And our speech... 
when it's gracious. It is like that. Wise Christian speech removes the inflammatory stuff. It removes the heightened toxic speech. <laughs> now, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I don't need to explain this. We've all done it. We've allowed circumstances or people to inflame passion, usually wrong, harmful passion, and we lash out with our words. And he says, if you want to impact the non-Christians in our lives, make sure you discipline your speech and you season your speech with godly wisdom. And the purpose is so that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. When we have a right attitude towards our speech, it gives us time to think through a conversation. It slows down our responses. And it gives us those little moments in time to take a breath and say, I don't think I'm going to answer that the way I'd like to answer that. I'm going to answer and respond in a more godly manner, a wiser manner that expresses grace. Well, Peter speaks to this as well in 1 Peter chapter 3. And here I want to just draw on a, a, a passage we don't talk about often. 1 Peter 3 verses 14 to 17. And it, it's about a, a valid testimony when suffering as a believer. In other words, when, when you're under pressure, when you're getting opposition because you're a Christian, because of your biblical values and your biblical stands. And this is what Peter writes in verse 14 to 17. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, just stop there. It is normal for Christians to suffer. Let's just lay that to bed. If you are caught up in this whole deceptive philosophical thinking that says Christians should only have comfort, only have wealth, only have the sweet things in life, you got one problem with that, you're fighting God. The Bible does not teach that. God's sovereign design for our lives is that just as his son suffered in this life, so we as little Christ, those in Christ, we will suffer for righteousness also. Now he says there, if you are suffering for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Now if you're suffering and getting opposition and harassment because of your biblical values, because of your Christianity, because your relationship with Christ, because of righteousness, then you're blessed. And you're thinking, well, how am I blessed? That's a fair question. How am I blessed, Lord? He goes on. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. There's blessing number one. Realize that you do not need to be in fear of those people who are giving you harassment. But, verse 15 continues, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Now here's a common scenario that many of us Christians fall into, unfortunately, and of which I have failed many times on. We are living righteously. We're doing things right. However, our righteous behavior draws negative attention from a non-Christian and they start to harass us. They start to get aggressive. They might get physically abusive. They might get verbally abusive. And then we fail to see, as Christians, we fail to see God in this process of persecution and we start to respond to that non-Christian bad behavior with equal bad behavior and we retaliate. We fight back. We rebel back. We protest back. We fight back. 
we argue back. We get very creative in our Christian high moral ground at justifying a wrong response to a bad Christian response to our righteous behavior. And Paul, I just love Paul's brutal honesty. He says, that's not how you honor God. That's not how you show God to be holy by bad behavior. Instead, before you get there, stop and think. Prepare, he says, always being prepared to make a defense. Reason through in the quiet of night. When you're doing your Bible reading, your times of prayer, reason through ways in which you can have a right God-honoring response to the harassment or the persecution from non-Christians to your right Christian living. This enables, here's another blessing, he says, having a good conscience. This enables you to have a good conscience. You won't feel guilty towards God for having a right Christ-like response to harassment. And you don't slander. When you're slandered, you don't slander back. Those, and this is for the purpose so that when people do slander you, those people slandering you will observe that you are not retaliating in the way they are. You are not responding in the ways that they would respond. And that is a good testimony for Jesus Christ being Lord of your life. That is a good testimony to the power of the Holy Spirit filling you and controlling you. And if you should suffer for good, and if that's God's will, then we should be thankful for that. We need to thank God for all things. Thank God for the privilege of suffering for righteousness sake. Thank God for the privilege of living Christ under extremely difficult circumstances. And we can ha thank God for him giving us the opportunities to live wisely before the unsaved people so that they can see the reality of Jesus Christ in our lives. This is living gospel message. This is living out the character of Christ. This is doing what we cannot do in our own strength, but we can do in the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. I do pray that this would be true in your life as it is in my life as we live in an ever-increasing hostile world towards Jesus Christ.